Hi guys, um, my name is Kirk Chancer, and um, today I want to talk about building an IaaS uh, and how it's easier than you think if you try and uh, do it with CloudStack. Um, so I'll give you a little background. Uh, this is me. Um, if any of you guys attended the Dojo speak, uh, talk yesterday, I uh, went over a little bit of my background. I came from a data center, uh, did all the grunt work of moving tapes, cables, all, uh, rebooting servers for clients and stuff like that. Uh, worked my way up to a systems administrator slash engineer at careerbuilder.com and then uh, got promoted to team lead in 2011 and uh, managed about a thousand servers. Uh, and then uh, in March of this year, I actually moved from Atlanta to Santa Monica for a uh, senior engineer role with uh, Cornerstone On Demand. Um, have a few, a few certifications and uh, I'm a Dell Tech Center rock star. Um, and what that means is just I'm social on Twitter and stuff like that with uh, talking about their products. Um, there's my About Me link and uh, my Twitter handle if you want to follow me. A um, little bit of an abstract. Some people have a myth that they say CloudStack isn't for them, and it may not be. Um, it's the reality. Like it, it does have countless use cases, but it may not be for everybody. Um, same with OpenStack. It, everything's got its fit for everybody, so not one thing will fit all your problems. Um, and CloudStack won't fix all your problem as a myth, but if it used correctly, it can make your life easier. Um, and CloudStack is better or worse than OpenStack, and neither is truly better than one or the other. They each have their own purpose. Um, and it's not that hard to get started with CloudStack. Um, they would instead OS yum install CloudStack dash management or Ubuntu app git install CloudStack management. There's a few more steps, but it's really that simple to get started. Um, these are some of the obstacles I faced before implementing CloudStack. I couldn't get hardware fast enough from our vendor. Um, we had three week, we were in the whole agile mindset, and so we had three week project cycles. Um, because of some of the vendors that we used, we couldn't guarantee that if we ordered a block of servers that we wouldn't get some that were dead on arrival. Um, so if I ordered 50 servers for a project, and I needed all 50 for that project, there's sometimes some wouldn't uh, work out of the box. Um, and when we had to change our script for a new project or team, it required resources and time to, to get that all configured. And then that delayed the project even further. Um, and I couldn't forecast what people needed because um, they were working on short, life, uh, short project cycles as well. Um, another problem that I faced was that the senior management always wanted to throw hardware at the problem because it was cheaper and faster to order servers than to optimize the code. Um, and then newer, Multi-threaded applications required more cores, more sockets, more RAM, and more network paths, and more disk, and everything, SSD. I mean, every, they just needed more lower latency and higher speed. Um, and then infrastructure as code. Um, my team only had two admins, so automation wasn't just a nice to have, it was a necessity. We needed, we were doing all our own work. We were going to the data center, racking our own servers, cabling our own servers, imaging our own servers. We didn't outsource anything. Um, we, so we came a long way for automation, but there's still a lot that could have been done for us. Um, there's still a lot of post work that we didn't, we didn't get the time to, to work on. So when I got the chance to deploy CloudStack, I, uh, I started off, I proposed to my management that I, we needed to, to change the way we were doing or we were gonna hit a wall at some point. We were just expanding, scaling out way too fast. Um, so we needed to uh, scale up a little bit and do some sort of virtualization. Um, so my goal for 2013 was to eliminate delivery obstacles and delay and delays for compute requests and uh, well from customers while avoiding substantial costs associated with mass scale virtualization. So this was the, the the workflow prior to implementing CloudStack. I would get a customer request. The initial request would come from a, tr a, a ticket or something like that, and so that starts the clock. We would order the servers if we didn't have enough spare capacity, and then we would, um, th this one was always our unknown variable because if we, if we ordered new servers or we ordered a, we had to do some testing if we wanted to start with testing SSDs or um, the, you know, switch from AMD to Intel or anything like that, we had to, we had to go through testing. So it was always a big variable of, it could be three weeks, six weeks, two months, any number of time. and dealing with a, a customer that has a three-week project cycle, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't working. Um, so when we receive the servers, we unpack them, rack them, cable them, configure the remote access, and depending on the quantity, this can take from an hour to a day. Um, 
know, image of servers. And like I said, we have a lot of automation around this, but there's still a lot that needed to be automated. Um, again, this can take another hour to a day, depending on more uh, how many servers we have. And then we hand off to the customer. And so once everything's done, we can hand it off to them, but if it's a new, new request and they need to test things, then they need to come back to us and we need to change things in the script or the, the image or whatever. Um, and then we can finally, once we're all, once both parties are happy, we actually close the ticket out, and that could be two, three, four months of start to end. And that just wasn't, a, a, I mean, wasn't acceptable because I had upwards of 10 customers, and all my customers were internal tech teams that were doing DevOps stuff, and so they needed hardware fast. And so this is what we did in 2.13. Um, customers can build their own production-ready, PCI-compliant, domain-available servers via UI or API. Um, in less than an hour. So the customer comes to me, well they don't even come to me anymore, um, they would go through the UI, click through the steps of building the, the, their image or their instance, and then they're done. Um, if they wanted to use the API, this little, uh, I don't know if you can see it, um, so it's a little cloud monkey script, and it said it'll iterate through 100 times deploying the virtual machine to the zone using this template, the service offering, this name, and it'll just sequence one through 100, um, and it'll put in a project, and it'll sleep for five seconds after it does each one, so it'll give it a time, the API time to process it. Um, but with that one command, you can deploy 100,000, depending on your infrastructure. It's really just the capacity of your ecosystem. Um, and you can change this to be different service offerings or different templates. So. And then when, they're, when that's done, they receive an automated email saying your, your server's ready. Um, and it, goes from, it went from days, weeks, months to less than an hour. Our Windows ones took about 55 minutes, and then our Linux ones took about 12 to 15 minutes, depending on which one they did. And from there, the arrows went the other way. The, there wasn't funneling into us. It was the customers would do their stuff and the, the only limitation now was the ecosystem. Um, so the UI would provide us this beautiful uh, statistics of how everything was. This is an actual screenshot of what we had. We had 27 terabytes of committed store, uh, usable storage. We had 13 committed, um, and only because of the, the way the storage we were using, um, we only had 1.5 actually used. Um, we had 1,280 cores, and half of them were committed. Uh, 10 terabytes of RAM and only two committed. Um, and then uh, we had about 150 instances out there. What was the difference? Sorry. Hmm? Okay. So the, we used um, a product from, uh, our storage solution was Nixenta, and it was an NFS solution. Um, and I don't know how the numbers came to this, but it was it would it, we all, we would have three we had three clusters in the in the, in the environment, and each cluster had a, a certain quota that they could use out of the twenty seven terabytes. So when you deploy a VM, if you chose a hundred gig or two hundred gig or five hundred gig uh, disk for your your offering, it would allocate that as part of this, but it's only using that's how many blocks were actually written to the to actual storage that were actually used was only 1.5 out of the whole 27 terabytes. Would your customers also be able to see what their allocation is in the quota and be able to figure out? Uh, because of the way we deployed it, no. Um, this was the admin, this was what the admin saw, so all of our team saw. Um, when they logged in, they logged into their projects, and so they saw their project, and they saw how many instances they had out of how many. Yes. Yeah, so if they had a quota of 50 VMs and they were using 20, they would see that. They wouldn't see this, the infrastructure no, no, level. Then, yeah. They, they, they could see their own quota. Yeah. But they wouldn't see statistics like this, yeah. Um, and so if there was a request that came that we couldn't support in, uh, in our environment in the classic ecosystem, we would just fall back to our normal methods for that. But it really it proved it, it's, it's worth uh, in gold when we, uh, when we deployed it. Um, we, opened access to our customers in the middle of October, and by the end of November, I'd say we had over 150 VMs up and running, um, anywhere from 
four cores to 16 cores and from 16 gigs of RAM to 64 gigs of RAM per instance. Um, so it's pretty good. Um, I was pretty happy with it. Uh, and this is the hardware details. Um, so we had 20 1U boxes. Uh, they were quad socket, uh, AMD Opteron. Uh, total dot each socket was 16 cores. So the math total dot to 1,280 cores, 10 terabytes of RAM, uh, 33 terabytes of NFS storage, um, and we only provisioned 27, just the way we did the math. Uh, since it was an extent-based solution, uh, it was it had read and write cache based off of SSD and uh, RAM, and so it could achieve 20,000 IOPS easily. Um, and we would, we did iometers all day long, and well, could see that. Uh, and the beauty of it, it was all connected via 10 gig Ethernet, uh, RJ45 connections. Um, so it was really easy to manage. We didn't have to get the network team involved for any of it. Um, and uh, the, the math right there for that we had around, it could support, we did the, all of our web servers were four core, 16 gig of RAM. And so we, we provisioned for that. And uh, it's like I said, currently running almost 200 instances. Uh, this is a little picture of it. Uh, so there's the 10 hosts on each side and then the storage solution at the bottom. Did you use the consent for primary and secondary? Yes. And so now you're asking, what about me? Um, so enough about my deployment. How do I get started? To get started, if you haven't played with CloudStack, scrounge up a few servers if you have access to them, or just spin up some VMs on your laptop on anything. Um, install the OS for the master server. I recommend CentOS 6. It's the lowest, lowest barrier to entry. It's very easy to use, very easy to run. There's lots of support for it because it's based off of the Red Hat distribution. Um, install an OS for the hypervisor, and I recommend Zen Server because, again, it's very easy to use. It's very easy to manage. Uh, there's a, a GUI con uh, Zen client console that you can poke around in so you don't have to know all the X API commands. And then uh, download and install the cloud stack on the master server, connect everything together, start with the basic zone, just get it out there, get it running, get it tested, join the mailing list, and then contribute back to the community. And if you're not a programmer, update the docs. Um, I know this all seems obvious, but uh, it's, it's, it's really easy to get started. Um, I had six weeks last year to provision a private cloud, and I didn't know anything about CloudStack, or I knew of OpenStack, and I knew that there was things out there to do private, uh, private clouds, but we needed something in those six weeks. I had to have production instances running on it, and I did it with CloudStack. I had production instances by the end of the six weeks, and I had commitment for my company to move forward on the deployment that I did. So I want to take it to scale, okay? So evaluate what you're trying to achieve and the obstacles you're trying to overcome. Uh, the reason why I did my deployment is, like I said, I couldn't keep up with the requests that I was getting from my customers. Um, or is that what you're trying to do? Or are you trying to art optimize your hardware utilization? Are you trying to do mass consolidation? Are you trying to do cost control for your compute resources? Um, you want to evaluate your hardware options. Do you want to do shared storage, or do you want to do local storage? That's an option with CloudStack, and it works fine. Do you want to do spindle or SSD? Do you want lots of cores, lots of RAM? Scale out, scale up. Big name, white box. It's all, it all works. I mean, my, my stuff was white box. It was uh, super micro boxes. And everything worked perfectly fine. Um, I, our, all of Career Builder was entirely a .NET shop, a, a, a Dell shop. We had over 1,000 Dell servers, and when I deployed this, it just I got everything for under 300 grand, including storage. Um, so it blew me out of the water. Um, uh, evaluate your software options. Like I said, Red, OS, Red Hat, CentOS, um, or Ubuntu. KVM, Zen, VMware, or now Hyper-V in 4.3. Uh, networking options. Uh, so I just, when I made this presentation, I had a little, I've been dealing with an email problem at work, and I missed the typo, sorry about that. Um, do you want to do fiber? Do you want to do SFP? Do you want to do uh, 10 gig Ethernet, or are you just doing one gig because you're on a, a generic server that from a that you're, uh, an old refurbished server? Are you going to do a basic or an advanced zone? Um, advanced zone gives you a lot more options, but it's a lot more complex to get started. So I recommend just starting with the basic and then working your way up because you've got to always create new zones and move things over to um, evaluate your support options. Cloud platform directly from Citrix or paid cloud stack support from companies like ShapeBlue. And then just put it all together and build it out. Um, it's just, just get started and then go. Um, that's it. Question? Yes? Um, I know this is a getting started thing, but could you comment on some of the advanced networking that you've done or just? 
the the our deployment we did was just a basic uh, deployment, um, but we fully intended to. Uh, we had Palo Alto fires at Kerbler, and so we wanted once 4.3 was released, we wanted to start taking advantage of the Palo Alto, uh, being able to have uh, changes pushed into the into the firewall, and then um, we wanted to, we used load balancers as well for all our, it was the front end for everything. We did use the virtual router, but it was only for DHCP. Um, the instances, since they were on the domain, they would register with the domain uh, for DNS. Uh, but then the virtual router was only handing out DHCP addresses. That's really the only thing it did. How about VPCs? Did you do anything? Nope. That's what I'm saying. Like this is we 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 wanted to just get the get it in there, and our our main goal was to accelerate the delivery of our instances. Um, but the 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 sky's the limit. No pun intended. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's full potential to do any corner, any sort of networking you want. Uh, it just takes a lot more planning and insight. And yes, good. Um, on one of your slides, there you had multiple customers. Uh -huh. What was your demarcation for each customer? Were they separated at pods or clusters? They were. We uh, provisioned projects for them, and then. So yeah, so we, we had the one uh, one domain, uh, one pod, one zone, three clusters, because with Zen you can only do eight servers in a cluster. Um, and so we just uh, put them all into their own uh, projects, and then we would put quotas on the project. So our biggest customer was our de automated deployment team. They had a, a project limit of 200 VMs, and then all the other customers only had project limits of 20 VMs, because that's all they were doing. Um, but we had one customer, he did the 20 and then came to us and said, I need five more. So we upped the quota, gave it, he was able to deploy five more servers. And so it just gave us a, a, a better insight into his growth pattern when he could just say, oh, okay, I need five more servers because I've reached my limit. So we can just go back and forth and say, well, I need to order two more servers. You can go ahead and deploy these five, but I can feed the back end while you're doing this. So. You say you have um, uh, Accenta storage? Yes. Were your experiences? It, it was great for the dev environment that we used it in. It did have its issues, um, but it wasn't anything that was impacting. Um, it was very easy to set up. We just presented it to be an NFS share. Um, but once we got everything, all the kinks worked out, um, occasionally it would, uh, we would have to fail over between the, the, node, the, the, master, the nodes, but it wasn't anything. Huh? Uh, no, we, 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 it would take under a minute to do the failover, and there was no impact to the customers. Um, I mean, but yeah, it's, I don't know if we would do it in production at, that, at the scale we had of that. If we did, we'd break it into a, a, like it wouldn't be the primary storage across the entire cluster. It would be a primary storage for a pod or a zone, and we'd just replicate that out a, a, a number of times. No, we just used the generic portal, and they would log in, and they would be dropped right into their project. And how, did the, how did customers uh, kick off the cloud on the they, they didn't get to that point. They just used the, the, the UI, um, because that's all they were doing. They were doing the, the only one that, uh, the automated deployment team that had the 200 VMs, he gave us a list, and we did, the cloud, we did it through CloudMonkey, but it was, they, they just weren't comfortable with it yet because they were just getting started with it um, as far as, you know, getting, you know, being able to deploy their own servers. They were just getting used to that mindset of that they don't need to come to me anymore. And they have a server ready in an hour and then they screw it up, they just destroy it and build, rebuild a new one. We deployed our servers the same way we did our, our the, the, the instances that were deployed on within CloudStack were deployed the same exact way as far as the, the user restrictions that were on them, as far as administrators. Um, everything was done via a post script on both Windows and Linux. Um, so everything that was needed for to meet our PCI compliance at Career Builder was done. Um, so the instances were audited the same way. Um, 
as far as the instances. That, that was our, our concern. The, the cloud stack stuff wasn't as big of a concern because it wasn't, it didn't need to be PCI compliant. The, the instances that were running transactional data were the ones that needed to be compliant. I, I left Curve Builder at the beginning of March, so I, um, I don't know what they've done since then. Um, but uh, when I was there, I mean, we finished it and presented it to all of our customers in October, and we had uh, two quarterly audits and a yearly audit and had no problems. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks for coming.